I was tweeting around the time that he took over the company about how Twitter should really get into recruiting. And after seeing a couple of these, he DM'd me and said, hey, how about I acquire Lasky? That would be interesting for me because I want to get into the space. From his perspective, he had made a lot of the critical hires in the early days at SpaceX, Tesla, OpenAI from Twitter just being like a passive, you know, user himself over the years. And so, you know, we sort of agreed over over a couple of months, like how we could make this work and what that, you know, acquisition would look like. And then ultimately close the deal in, in May of last year. You know, the vast majority of money that you get from a $50 million exit goes to investors. And it's almost as like aqua hire like to, to the founding team. And so I think just being very careful and methodical about like, not do we have the ability to raise more money, because I think in, in both of my last companies, we did, but being very, very careful about like, what are the outcomes that get eliminated if we go and raise the next round? If we raise a series A for us as founders, like kind of forget about the rest of the, the cap table for a second. Like for us as founders, what is the new level that we need to sell for? What's the new amount that we need to sell for to even have this be mildly interesting for us, for us to make like a couple million or five million or $10 million, like you so up the ante with every new round of venture. What can you share about how the algorithm works? Let me, let me pull up a spreadsheet. I'll show you everything. Welcome to The Peel, where we explore the world's greatest startup stories. I'm your host, Turner Novak, founder of Banana Capital, the only venture capital firm that actually knows how the Twitter algorithm works. In this episode, I sit down with my friend, Chris Bakke. Chris has founded and sold multiple companies, all in the HR tech space, all for between $25 and $100 million. Most recently, to Elon Musk, is his first acquisition since purchasing X, formerly known as Twitter. Chris takes us inside the process of selling to Elon, what it's like reporting to him, how the Twitter algorithm actually works, and his favorite proprietary trade secret at X. Chris also shares his philosophy around company building, reasons to consider selling your company for a smaller exit instead of raising tons of venture capital, and how he survived inside big tech as a founder. Chris is known for being a prolific meme lord on Twitter slash X and talks us through his framework of using memes for marketing, his top three favorite meme formats, and the tool he uses to make memes, which will probably blow your mind. It did, it did for me. Before we get started, a quick shout out to Chris's co-founder, Daniel. Nikita Beer and Trunk Fan for suggesting topics for the episode. Without further ado, let's talk to Chris. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So I'm excited to have you because you and your company, Lasky, was the very first acquisition under new Elon ownership of X, formerly known as Twitter. Can we just spend a couple minutes just talk through that story? I mean, I think that's really interesting for people. I mean, I think that that Twitter had historically been looking for ways to monetize their audience in in sort of more effective ways for many, many years. I think one of the things, and, and happy to talk about how we got into this, but one of the things that I was doing was publicly tweeting a lot about just the recruiting industry and the HR tech space. So for, for quick context, we were a recruitment automation company. So we were building a lot of stuff that was helping recruiters and founders find talent that's sort of better, faster, cheaper. And we had built the company over about two and a half years, I had raised a, a seed round for it. And ultimately, I thought that there was this big opportunity where uh, if you look at kind of the big job boards in the space, like Indeed and LinkedIn, they kind of notoriously are bad at like engineering hiring and design hiring and product manager hiring and early salespeople hiring. And so AngelList had taken some of that, which is now sort of a product called WellFound. But ultimately, I think if you look at the ways in which early stage companies hire, a lot of it is, is quite network-based. And so when we thought about sort of the network effects and network dynamics that were happening on Twitter for many years, our thesis was that, you know, there was all of this sort of hiring activity that was happening on Twitter that was that was really under monetized and under invested in from a product perspective. And so I think you see that in the outcomes of, of both businesses. Like when, when Elon took over Twitter, you know, it, it, it was doing, I think, like $4 billion in revenue. Uh, LinkedIn will do, you know, over $10 billion in revenue this year with a much smaller user base. And so in terms of like the value that you get on a per user basis, if you can map a lot of detailed work history about those users. From an advertising perspective, it, it becomes really interesting. And then also from just a subscription and value add perspective, people rate the platforms where they get jobs very highly. Like if you've worked with a recruiter before, uh, you tend to think very positively about that recruiter. If you, you know, people actually have pretty good things to say who find jobs through LinkedIn, it's sort of a joke to the rest of us. But 
if you can add a meaningful amount of value by helping somebody find this sort of like critical position in, in their life that is a really important step in their life, then that becomes really valuable from a platform perspective. And so I was tweeting in, you know, around the time that he took over the company about how Twitter should really get into recruiting. And I was sort of doing it with the angle of, you know, if we can sign like a multi-million dollar partnership with Elon's Twitter, then that's, you know, great for our company. And after seeing a couple of these, he DM'd me and said, hey, how about I acquire Lasky? That would be interesting for me because I want to get into the space. He obviously has deep roots with, uh, with Reed Hoffman from the PayPal days who started LinkedIn. He was kind of familiar with LinkedIn's business at a high level. And I think from his perspective, he had made a lot of the critical hires in the early days at SpaceX, Tesla, OpenAI from, from Twitter just being like a passive you know, user himself over the years. And so he's like, I understand that there's value here. I understand that the like founder to engineering networks are super strong and other engineers will often post updates about where they just got a job. And those updates will get, you know, two, three, 500 likes. And then other engineers will say, what's this company? And so the means of like discovering new opportunities is sort of built in. And so, you know, we sort of agreed over, over a couple months, like how we can make this work and what that, you know, acquisition would look like. And then ultimately closed the deal in in May of last year. Wow. Yeah, it's and it's true. I mean, I I've hired people from Twitter, seen people get hired from Twitter in the sense of, you know, under monetizing the network. I I almost feel like that's an understatement just in terms of you look at the value that's been captured by, you know, similar social network products. Twitter's definitely near the bottom of the list, I guess I'll say, or historically was. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 so much money exchanging hands there, and I, I think you see it with the number of quite successful, you know, staffing businesses and and hiring businesses. A lot of people have you know done these like hire an outsourced EA, and like all the marketing is happening on Twitter for these businesses, or you know, hire an outsourced developer. You have businesses like you know TopTel, which is at many hundreds of millions of dollars in, in GMB, and like they're you know advertising and using things like you know Twitter and Facebook to get a lot of that demand side and supply side signups. And so, yeah, I mean, our business just at Lasky, from basically my personal Twitter account, was was driving around like two to three million dollars in in revenue per year from just sort of advertising that we were you know this hiring solution. And a lot of the founders that are sort of now using our new product, which is X Hiring, were using Lasky before. And so you saw all of these like, you know, tangential spinoffs of like companies that were doing five, 10, $25 million by, you know, running their business and, and like collecting all the demand by, by just tweeting about hiring. And so I think if we can like centralize that and formalize that for them, it also makes it a better product. Like nobody ultimately wants the, the hiring conversations to like live in DMs forever. And so by playing nicely with sort of the rest of the stack, which are like these applicant tracking systems and you know, big shitty platforms like Workday that all the big companies use, like we can actually drive a lot of enterprise value in, in, in terms of like charging users for those types of things too. And would that be something that's bundled into X premium or maybe like ancillary, like add on, what do you call it? Like a la carte features or something? Yeah, exactly. So right now, any any verified org on X has access to all of the hiring features. Most premium users also have access to some basic hiring features. So if you were to say like hire a new like person on the content or production team, or if you were to hire an associate, like you could actually post a job to your profile because you, you have a premium account. And so all premium users in the US right now can post up to three jobs for free. And then we'll sort of look at ways of, you know, monetizing for, for sort of slightly bigger users that want to post like five or 10 or 20 jobs at a time. I know, I know you've, you've talked to me a little bit about how this is all going. What, how do I sign up if I'm listening and I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. What, what do I do? We haven't made it easy. Uh, if you if you want to, and I think deliberately so, and we can talk about that actually, I think a lot of this is like, if the if the features are good, the, the self-discovery will become like fairly obvious and people will kind of clamor to, to get access to these things. So right now with a premium account, uh, if you go to like the left rail of your Twitter account or X account, you'll see like a, a number of like preferences and there'll be a hiring tab there. For verified orgs, uh, there's also a hiring tab in the left org. For people that are looking for a job, you can go to x.com slash jobs. And I believe by the time this episode comes out, we will have crossed a million unique jobs on, on X. So that's exciting. And you kind of hit on some interesting points, this whole verified org. It's just like a new thing. There's probably a lot of directions that that's going to go over time, I would assume. It's interesting in terms of how you can take a free 
social network or a free platform for businesses and then add, like you said, some of these like a la carte features, but do it in like a bundled subscription way. I think that the businesses we don't share publicly, but the, the traction on verified orgs has been exceptional. And I think from just quality of revenue perspective, obviously, if, if like every startup is advised, you know, find ways to get out of like clumpy ad based revenue and try to move towards something more sustainable by locking people into you know, annual subscriptions. Like we're not immune from that same advice. And I think Elon's very aware that like the quality of our revenue by moving to, you know, selling premium accounts for somewhere between eight and $16 a month, selling verified org accounts for somewhere between 200 and a thousand dollars a month. If you look at what those companies actually get, you have companies like, you know, Tesla and SpaceX. Uh, that are spending many, many millions of dollars on platforms like Indeed and LinkedIn, and they're getting you know sort of a fraction of the access right now to hiring features. But as we sort of build that network and help drive more and more and more of their hires for a thousand dollars a month, they're getting this like you know quite exceptional deal today. And I think it only gets better as we start to build more things there around like creator rev share and uh, you know different like business features around advertising and hiring. And then also sort of bringing those best features down to premium users that like the millions of people that pay for premium can also get access to similar features. Going to one point you mentioned earlier about quality of revenue. I do remember back, this was probably like a, I don't know, it was in the headlines maybe a year ago, whatever, shortly after the acquisition, people were making a big deal about Twitter's ad revenue dropping. And it was like, if you just step back a little bit and look broadly what was happening and like brand spend, which was basically all Twitter's ad revenue. It was just like brand. It was, they don't really have, they, it didn't have much performance marketing at the time. It was all down like 50%. And so there's the people that were like criticizing, like, oh, this is like a terrible acquisition. Like he's going to go bankrupt, well, like whatever, like the extreme end of it. It's like, well, actually it was probably going to happen anyways. He probably paid too high a price, but like, you know, like, I mean, if he, if, if the richest person in the world didn't own it and like, you know, have a little bit of a backstop there, it'd probably be even in even worse shape right now. Yeah. Yeah. He, he bought it at the, at like maybe one of the worst possible, like high watermark stock prices that you could have purchased at that. But yeah, I think the, the point is, is apt. Like number one, all advertising suffered during that period and, and continues to suffer to a lot of that, I'd say a, a large percentage of that revenue has and will be recaptured through sort of better lines of business, like, you know, subscription based offerings and, and API access and access to the hiring tools and to monetization tools and to payments tools eventually. And then I, I'd say the, the third thing there is it's definitely worth thinking about, like that, that I think we as a company, you know, we, we like advertising revenue and I think Elon likes it for, for obvious reasons. Like it pays the bills for, for all of us to work there. It's high margin. Yeah. It's, it's high margin, but also like in terms of what a higher quality experience is, if you look at the way that, you know, a lot of these, you know, consumer platforms have evolved, it's like you can sort of use it for free. And if you use the product for free, you're going to get ads, but you can buy your way out or you can partially buy your way out of a sort of ad heavy experience. Which I think for somebody like me and, and for obviously lots of other people, if you're using X today to, you know, check in on a concert or to check like something happening in politics and you're using it a couple times a month, it may not be worth the, you know, eight dollars that we charge to go premium. But if it's something that you find yourself like using and scrolling and interacting with every day, to pay that price and to not only see your own content get boosted, but also to remove a bunch of the the sort of like ads that you're you're seeing on a daily basis, like as that evolves and as more people go premium. We understand that that like sort of cannibalizes a bit of the the ad business. Like we, we have fewer impressions and fewer accounts that we can actually sell ads against. And I think that's very okay with with Elon and, and sort of his like bigger vision here. Yeah. So you hit on a really interesting point there. The algorithm. How does it work? Do you know what can you share about how the algorithm works? Let me let me pull up a spreadsheet. I'll show you everything. Uh, I, I think that the goal actually that that we've moved toward is to make a lot of these decisions in, in a somewhat, I would say, open source in, environment where we, we do publish sort of a, a lot of the ways that the algorithm works. And, and a lot of that is just to, you know, with a very small team, like X today is a very small company for the number of users that we serve. I, I think that, you know, under the new ownership, we've really had this mantra of, free speech. And I would say like, it's it's sort of like free asterisk speech, where one of the things obviously that Elon is trying to crack down on are things like, you know, AI based replies and, and crypto spam and all sorts of that, which I, I think has ebbed and flowed a lot over time. Like there are weeks as a 
employee, but also power user where I'm on the timeline and I'm like, I think we're doing an amazing job with spam. And then there's other times where I'm like, it's never been worse than today. And, and I think like just based on the, the the changes that we're making around how easy or difficult we make it for new accounts to sign up, how easy we make it for you know those accounts to add premium badges and sort of unlock some uh, some of those features, like how much we're rate limiting new users when they're when they're commenting, um, all of that stuff I, I think affects the spam problem. But a lot of the algorithm changes that we make are are sort of public. I, I can't talk too too closely about like the algorithm itself, but I would say that there's basically becoming you know, multiple tiers. Like the the idea that we have is, you know, freedom of speech, not reach, which I, I kind of like that as a term because it means that like you can go on as a brand new account or as an existing account and you can say, you know, terribly unhinged things. And as long as they're not illegal, you know, we have a very fast growing content moderation team that will, you know, do things ideally to suppress, you know, that type of content to make it sort of only available to that person's immediate network. And even if people are sort of retweeting and reposting it, you know, sort of limit the, the access that that kind of stuff gets. But premium accounts across the board, including verified org, just get sort of a higher, more premium treatment in the algorithm where their content gets a, a much higher paid reach, basically, by paying that, you know, eight to a thousand dollars a month for access. Because we're assuming like that, that's sort of how all these social media platforms evolve is that, you know, one percent of the users are contributing somewhere between you know, typically like 70 and 90% of all the content from a post perspective. And so if we can get a large percentage of those, those one top 1% of users to pay, then presumably the the quality of that content will be a lot higher than like brand new accounts that come on and just start like spewing, you know, crypto spam from day one. But it's an evolution. Like I think that there are certainly pros and cons to all of these approaches when it comes to to curbing, you know, spam and and just like bad shitty replies and and i think you know we've just tried a lot of stuff i think when it comes to the algorithm it changes a lot because the team is shipping really fast and and i and i would hope that like when we get stuff wrong i I think that we're very quick to to recognize okay this is bad like the way that we're treating you know articles as images is like not a great outcome and like we need to change that for for sort of a better user experience but yeah, I think we're we're testing a lot of stuff and, and we're we're looking in real time at, at how users are reacting to it. One more question kind of on the algorithm. Is there a way I know you're you're a power user of Twitter. You you do a very good job of taking advantage of how it works. If I wanted to, you know, go super viral, get a lot of views, et cetera, I don't know how you want to describe this. What would be kind of like best practices just in terms of like maximizing your reach in the algorithm? Any like rough high level you'd share with someone? The idea of niche content is going viral is is actually true. Like what what I think you and I would see if we were like brand new users to to X today is you would see you know a mix of posts depending on how many people that you follow that we're we're trying to promote kind of new you know new users or low follower content and sort of get some initial exposure so that you know as a new user you have the chance to look at a bunch of accounts throughout the day and based on like things like dwell time, like how long are you focusing on a particular tweet? Do you spend a lot of time looking at that tweet, even if you don't interact with it? Because the vast majority of of users never actually like hit the like button or hit the comment button or the reshare button. And so based on factors like like dwell time, which is basically like how many, you know, seconds or milliseconds are you spending on like on a particular piece of content, that sort of influences a, a lot of how often we show it to other users. And then also how many of those users are likely to interact with it. So I think when you think about the idea of going viral, you know, one of the things that I, I think has worked really well for both you and I is like, we have, despite having quite a few followers, like we actually post about fairly niche stuff. Like, like people will say like, oh, you have, you know, over a hundred thousand followers or over 200,000 followers. I'm like, Google has like 300,000 employees. Like, is that, is that good? If I'm talking about tech content, like all day, every day, and I haven't even gotten, you know, one fifth of like Amazon's employee base to follow me. I, I, I don't know. And so, but the idea is if you're constantly posting about, you know, VC or startups or founder led sales or build in public type stuff, that's, that's unique to like early stage company engineers or other founders. There may only be like a few thousand of those people, but I think a lot of times we see content that's across sports and politics and like all the shit that we may or may not care about. But a lot of people use the platform for like professional purposes or for educational purposes or to learn. And I think you see that a lot with the quality of engagement that you get on a post, which often is noted by like how many bookmarks you're getting on a post. 
So I'd say if you want to go viral, but the thing to actually do is post like, you know, multiple times per day over two plus years, and then you'll, you'll eventually start to see some hits, but like tailor that content to a specific niche. I, I think whether that niche is like your favorite sports team or, you know, God forbid, like a political candidate that you really like, or like, you know, but I think the more specific that you can be with the type of content, you will attract followers that also find that really niche content interesting. Like the idea that you can post just like a funny video and go viral and just the, the viral videos that are generic of funny stuff that you're seeing are, are happening, you know, like 10 times per day, but there's millions and millions of accounts trying that stuff. Like actually much more likely that you have a viral hit that resonates with like LA Dodgers fans than you do with like content that resonates with like all sports fans. So it'd sort of be my, my high level advice is like consistency post every day, multiple times a day, and then make the, make the content really focused. And, and dwell time too, it sounds like is really important. So that's, that doesn't even show up in like the public engagement, whether it's uh, like views, it doesn't actually measure dwell time, retweets, likes, bookmarks. It's really like, cause I might sit there looking at something, share it with a million people and none of them, none of them like it, retweet, and maybe the view show up, but it doesn't show like, whole, they all looked at it for minutes. The stuff that we get criticized for, and again, some of this is just like, what type of algorithm do you want? That the type of content that, you know, we get criticized for, if you think about it, is like, why am I seeing all these videos of like armed robberies and car crashes and train wrecks and like fight videos and like terrible things happening? And it's like, the reason that we show you stuff like that is because you dwell and you watch those videos for a really long period of time. And so we think that you like them. So there's like, there's that side of the algorithm, which is like anything that you do algorithmically, like people are going to find a way to game. And unfortunately we live in a society where like, I like to think I don't actually enjoy that type of content. But when I'm seeing that content a lot in my feed, it's worth, it's worth like critically asking yourself, am I seeing all this fight content because I actually do watch the first 40 seconds of every fight video to see who gets their ass kicked. And then I'm like, Oh, why do I keep seeing all this stuff? Because on every other tweet, it's text-based. And so you're spending like milliseconds or one or two seconds, like reading the thing and then swipe, swipe, swiping. The video stuff is super engaging. I think across all platforms right now, because it forces people to like, stop, give it a few seconds. And then we're sort of saying, what other similar or adjacent video stuff can we serve you kind of that would, you know, be in a similar format to that. So yeah, thinking about how long people dwell on your content is, is definitely worthwhile. Yeah. It, it sounds like, you know, dwell time or time spent really ties into all these other like secondary advice that you might get, like focus on your niche, make sure you have a good hook, make the editing, like the fast cuts in the beginning, whatever, all this stuff basically comes down to do people spend time watching it really at the end of the day, make content that people consume. I do it all the time because I, I like it, but people hate like the, the short sentence line break stuff that expands. So like you could, you could be a normal person, write a paragraph about what happened. You could be like a tech influencer and you could be like, the year was 2021. I'm working at Google. I'm a mid-level PM. And the story just goes on and on and on and on. Like the reason that people format stuff like that is because like, A, the readability of having, you know, mind spacing is actually kind of helpful if you're reading like on a very small screen, which which 80% of our users are. Um, and that's true across like any network. And the, the reason that like you have these kind of like jump takes and cut takes and YouTube shorts and everything is because it's like you're on a small like mobile device. You're like in the train going to work. You're like between meetings or something like what can you interact with very quickly but then also, what can we get you to invest 20, 30, 40, 50 seconds on so that like the algorithms on YouTube, on Instagram, on X, on LinkedIn are likely to show you kind of similar content and then also like repurpose other content that I have you know, in the place of that over and over and over again. So that's the reason that you're seeing a lot of this like, like long form-ish content with lots of line breaks and obviously all of the like short kind of native video stuff on, on platforms work, work really well today. So one thing I want to make sure we hit on reporting to Elon. You're acquired. You, I think you mentioned before you meet with him pretty consistently. What is it like working for Elon? Uh, he generally is dividing his time across like six or seven businesses, plus all of the, the side project stuff that he has going on. So, you know, we take all the time that we can get in, in, in kind of slivers. I, I think most people are surprised. Like if you think about his entire portfolio, of of companies not only that he has you know started or or taken over but that he is also like incubating or investing or like spending lots of really time on i think it's amazing 
to think that he can have an, a week where he's spending lots of times with like the Tesla and SpaceX and Neuralink and Boring Company and and you know XAI teams, but still has actually like an incredible amount of time for the the X teams and kind of new products and, and new things that are going on. So a pretty typical week is on on Wednesdays we do a product review meeting, which is generally like. 60 to 70 kind of core product and, and engineering people. It's actually, I think, like a third of the product and engineering board. We will like sit in a giant conference room with him on Wednesdays and and just get like live feedback. We'll like literally like go around the horn and go around the table. And a lot of times there'll be like one person in that sort of core products group, which is sort of all the main like, you know, timeline stuff that you're seeing any obvious like or or even small ux changes I, I think that you know his mantra is like he doesn't like to be surprised by stuff that he's seeing like it would be very bad if he opened his phone and saw a bunch of like job recommendations and was like what the fuck is this um and so a lot of it is like admits all of the other businesses that he's running um just trying to update him on on things that are coming down the pipeline is sort of the purpose of that and i think he is very active and responsive in in those meetings in terms of like seeing what has or hasn't worked across other, you know, apps that he's used. I think when it comes to certain, you know, things that we're working on, like payments or hiring for that matter, we'll often have like secondary meetings after that. So we might give like a quick update in that meeting. And then like every, every, you know, couple of weeks, we might have like a, a 45 minute to hour and a half long, like one-on-one -on -one with him, where it's basically like myself and Daniel, my co-founder and, and Elon either over like zoom or or sort of live in san francisco in a conference room where we're sort of just like running him through a bunch of like figma stuff and a bunch of data that we're seeing around like performance and and you know uh, user feedback and then ultimately i think a lot of it depends on what side of the business you're on like you know if you're on the spaces team like elon uses spaces he'll often have a lot more meetings leading up to like a big spaces thing that he's doing with like you know, RFK before that, just to make sure that like site stability and all that is is, is in place. We're, we're in kind of a unique spot because we are a like emerging part of the business, but that's very closely tied to revenue. So I also spend, even though I report to Elon, I spend a lot of time with like Linda and who's our CEO and, and those teams on sort of the advertising and, and revenue sides, just giving updates and, and things like that. But yeah, like a typical month is probably like four to five large group meetings with maybe like two to three, you know, smaller breakout one-on-ones. And then every Friday, we will also send him sort of like an individual update that, you know, gets read over the weekend just around like how all of the sort of hiring related stuff is gone. And I think that that's pretty consistent in all of his businesses. Like Friday afternoon, he's collecting like dozens of these updates across like Tesla and SpaceX and everything. The, the kind of crazy thing that I that I haven't really figured out that I think is under discussed is is the context switching like he can very quickly like jump from a like a meeting it, it, like from the X office where he's like talking to people about like live streaming and video over to a hiring focused conversation over to like a payments and like money transmittal licenses conversation and then leave the office at three to go down to Tesla and be talking about like, you know, self-driving cars and batteries and robots. And then like that night, we'll be back in Texas, like on site with SpaceX, like talking about rockets. So, you know, that that's like a pretty typical day for him is like jumping between like three or four sort of major companies and like major projects within those companies at once. So it's, it's pretty impressive. I think his his like ability to do that, because I think that I would be terrible at that. Like I can barely stay focused on on one thing at a time and and so his ability to like context switch and give actually like very good feedback on sort of what's happening is is uh is pretty amazing well as a early stage venture capitalist with a podcast you know i'm adding tons of value to my companies one minute and i'm jumping on to record an episode with chris a couple minutes later i mean i do a ton of context switching too so i can relate that's right a lot of people call Turner the, the Elon of, of early stage venture investing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a common thing that I hear all the time. Yeah, that'd be the, uh, the, the epitome of my career is, is getting that title. So one concept I know we wanted to hit on is selling your company for, we'll say, 25 to $100 million. Really good outcome for certain parts of the kind of the, the cap table. Not the most exciting outcome for other ends of the cap table. So how do you do that? What is that process like? Because it seems like you've, you've almost mastered it. I would say it's 
you know, if you if you think about from a cap table perspective, it's it's super variable. Like, I mean, from selling kind of two comp- my last two companies in in that range, if you think about let's just say like a, a fifty million dollar exit, wh- what'll commonly happen is you're raising, you know used to be like in my first company, we were raising, I think, as one of like the hottest YC companies nine years ago, and you're raising like $2 million at like a 14 cap. Maybe that's like a a, a pretty average round today. Like the math there on a $50 million outcome is is so different where like, you know, for for YC's sake, you're you're returning like 12 or 13 X to, to YC. And and I think at both of my companies, they basically exited after two years. So over like a two year time horizon for them, it's really good. We actually had investors that were invested at like a four, five, six cap that, that were actually investing before YC. So for them, it's like a 10 X or 11 X or 12 X or in, in two years, they're pretty thrilled with it. They could probably redeploy. You basically just got gave them like five new checks, eight new checks they could write out of the same fund. Yeah, exactly. So like it interviewed, um, we had, you know, Cyan Bannister, who, who at the time was was uh, Founders Fund and and uh, Jason Calacanis and, and a couple of people that were in before YC. And so it was it was a good feeling to be able to, you know, you know, hand them one point two million back on their hundred thousand dollar investment that they had made, you know, twenty one months prior or whatever. And and I think that those investors are, you know, not only supportive, but super excited to support whatever you do next. And then like if you're if you're raising at a 14 cap, you have, you know, a lot of investors where you like 3x, you know, their money or something where it's like, hey, we didn't quite get it this this time around. But I think from a founder outcome perspective, one of the things that I was always pretty obsessed with was if you kind of zoom out from that and you've raised, you know, $2 million at a 14 cap and then you sell the company for 50 million, which is sort of what happened with our, with our first company, the, the, the VCs and it, you know, actually not really VCs like angel investors for the most part who are sort of, you know, participating in that $2 million round, you know, something like maybe like five or $6 million goes back to them, which means that you have like over $40 million that goes to the founders and the early employees of the company. And so I think for us, it, it turned into this like, you know, very life changing event of, of selling like a very ho hum company in a very ho hum space of like this niche in talent acquisition to Indeed, which I think at the time in, in 2017 was much more under the radar than, than it is today. They were doing 4 billion in revenue and had 4,000 employees. But I, I think that they, you know, even still today being much, much larger than that, they just fly a little bit under the radar. So it's like this kind of average outcome to an Austin based company that's owned by a hold co in Japan, like cool guys. But, you know, for us, it was like, you know, we, we had the situation where we worked for two years and, and, you know, the, the founders are getting 15, $20 million. There's individual on, you know, engineers on the team that are becoming millionaires. It was this like very life-changing outcome. And so I, I saw that and I, I didn't necessarily try to like engineer it for the, the next company, but I, I did think a lot about you know, certainly today from a founder perspective, all of your eggs are ideally in one basket. And so making sure that you can understand the upside of what you get from venture, which is like generally the ability to to move a lot faster and to corner markets and to go hire great people. And I think it all is about speed. But I think what we've seen over the last, you know, year and a half to two years is the danger of companies that were never really in a great position to do that, who could just like afford to do that. And you know, your situation is so different if you even just choose with that same company to raise a series A, right, and then sell the company for 50 million, depending on the, you know, like the the sort of stack and the way things work, like it's very possible that you could raise a, a $20 million series A and a $2 million seed. And then, you know, the vast majority of money that you get from a $50 million exit goes to investors. And it's almost as like aqua hire like to, to the founding team. And so I think just being very careful and methodical about like, not not do we have the ability to raise more money? Because I think in, in both of my last companies, we did. Um, but being very careful about like, what what are the outcomes that get eliminated if we go and raise the next round? If we raise a series A for us as founders, like kind of forget about the rest of the, the, the cap table for a second. Like for us as founders, what is the new level that we need to sell for? What's the new amount that we need to sell for to even have this be mildly interesting for us, for us to make like a couple million or five million or $10 million. Like you so up the ante with every new round of venture. And I think I have friends that have done that, you know, very successfully and have led companies all the way to IPOs. And I I think at some point, 
I'm a little bit of a, a chips off the table kind of guy. Like if we can get a company to $5 million in revenue and a 50 or $60 million exit, that's like a pretty hard thing to say no to, at least in my last two companies. Now, I, I do think a lot about like for whatever's next, especially working for Elon and seeing the way that he does not sort of hedge when it comes to like chips on the table. It's it's informed my thinking a little bit, but I also think just from a, you know, there's always this debate around like first time founders and second time founders, super young founders or older founders with kids and sort of what matters to them. I definitely think at this stage in my life, you know, living in the suburbs and, and having, you know, a couple of exits and stuff, I, I probably... There's part of my brain where it's like I'm I'm less willing than ever to take big risks, but also it's probably the best time in my life to take risks because now I I care a lot less about like a third fifty million dollar exit. Like I think part of your brain is like, could I actually go and like build the company that I've sort of always wondered what it would be like to build, which is maybe more capital intensive and would require multiple rounds and sort of ends in like disaster or IPO. And like that actually sounds pretty fun. And so I, I, I think that, yeah, just in terms of more tactically to your question, the thing for us was that we got advice on is that at any stage, there's only so many companies that are going to acquire your company. And I think at the seed stage, realistically, for most companies, if you're going to sell, you know, after you've raised a pre-seed or a seed, maybe that list is like 20 to 30 companies. Every time you raise a round, you probably drop like five to 10 companies from that list, right? There's just like, there's fewer companies that can afford a $250 million deal than a $50 million deal. You get into the unicorn type deals and there are maybe like one or two companies in your space, regardless of what space you're operating in that can do that deal. And often if it's two, like one is private equity, right? Hmm. Well, and then there's also antitrust too. It's like, cool, there's one company that could actually afford and it would make strategic sense. But yeah, guess what? The European Union does not, will not approve it. So... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a super interesting point. It's like the I, I put out this this tweet that that was partially a joke, partially serious about all the antitrust stuff. And it's like, you know, the, the, the two paths to unicorn type outcomes have always been some mix of like IPO or selling your company for, you know, a billion or $10 billion. If the if the, you know, IPO market is essentially dead or stalled right now, and the antitrust stuff has made it very hard to sell a company for $10 billion. Um, the only money left in tech is, you know, selling companies to Facebook for fifty million dollars, which is what like Nikita Beer, uh, who's who's a prolific X user, and I have done over and over. And it's it's like it is kind of true. Like I, I think for a lot of companies and a lot of founders that I talk to, even if they have a really healthy business and the business is worth like you know one point two billion in their last round, maybe it's worth like four hundred to eight hundred million realistically today, like. Who in their space is just going to shell out eight hundred million dollars in in cash or stock? And like, how does that deal actually get approved today? And should they just stay heads down for another five years and sort of wait for IPOs to open back up or whenever they open up? And that's a that's an interesting place to be in. But I also think it will unlock like a whole host of like interesting like secondary opportunities, like what we saw with Stripe and what we saw with OpenAI and like what a lot of companies are doing now and have done for a while. But there's probably like new companies and sort of new categories of like taking chips off the table that get created in that environment. If like so much wealth is being created so quickly by, let's say, open AI, but like unlike either that business IPOs or, you know, exits right now, unless that's to like Microsoft for 80 plus billion dollars. So, yeah, unlocking sort of short term wealth for, for founders and early employees will be an interesting category, I think. Yeah, I think for me personally, like I just think through probably the first 30, I'm, I'm almost 33, but probably the first 30 years of my life, it was like, I think I can't remember how old I was when I finally paid off my student loans, but like it was, you know, only a couple of years before that, like it took me a while to get to a point where I was like, okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not set for life or whatever, but like I really couldn't take any risks for a while because it was almost, and you know, I got married pretty early, had kids pretty early. So again, you're kind of you're in this weird spot where it's like, I got a family. I have to be, you have to be careful, strategic about the risks that you do take. And then I think it was probably about three years ago when I was like, okay, I'm at a point where maybe I can start to strategically take some very selective risks that I feel are the most de-risked I can possibly get them before I do them. So I feel like there's that, that's an element of it too, is like, Sometimes taking the chips off the table at a certain time or, you know, selling, cashing in, you know, going home, leaving the table, leaving the casino and going to a different casino, whatever analogy you want to make. 
sometimes that can actually be pretty strategic to then actually start taking even more bigger risks that to your point, it's like you want to build the dream company, the next one that you could not have done if you didn't de-risk a little bit first. So for sure. And, and I think some of that is also, you know, what what do you want to spend your life on? And I think to be honest with Blasky, it was like I had been, you know, by the time, you know, I think this now is year like 10 of working in and running HR tech companies. And so some of that element is you know, if you are able to by, you know, through, you know, investing in companies or working at early stage companies or starting them, if you are able to de-risk there, there is, which I think a lot of people have asked themselves in the last three or four years for various reasons, like to your joke earlier, like, you know, is, is doing what I'm doing right now still today, the best use of my time. And I, and I think that if you raise a smaller amount of money, if you're unsure about that, for, for those of us who haven't necessarily nailed their life's purpose, even if we found something super lucrative, it, just having that optionality, it, it can make a lot of sense. Then yeah, like you said, I think on the family side, we, we underestimate the societal pressures of being like, you know, your, your, your father-in-law or whatever being like, so you are married to my daughter and you have kids and you're going to be a VC. Like what the fuck is that all about? You know, we're like, well, you're going to start a a talent acquisition company to automate sending assessments to BPO workers. Like, "Hmm, is there money in that? And you want to marry my daughter? Like, I think my family was always very supportive, but you know, you hit like 30 or 35 and you start to see your friends who, you know, went into banking or went into accounting and they have like really shitty lives when they were in their 20s. But like those payback periods are finally like hitting when they cross 30, 35 and they're like starting to get on more of a partner track. And it's like, wow, doing all that grind work for the last decade plus is starting to pay off. And then you kind of look at your situation and it's like, am I happy doing this? Am I just doing it for the money? Do I, I I don't know. It's easy to question kind of based on like, your own network and, and friends and family and stuff too, which is an interesting dynamic. So yeah, I kind of I did I did the grind work, never really made a lot of money, and kind of got off that train and started a new train that required more grind work. But <laughs> it was all it you know it was well because you know you make those spreadsheets when you're 23 and you're setting up your 401k and you're just like if I contribute do the match for 40 years I'll make two million dollars and you know. I don't know. It's easy, but it's also hard. Like it's kind of like you, you, you talked about, um, I, I know we, this is one of the topics you want to hit on was like surviving at a big company. I mean, I've worked at some big companies before. It's not for me. I just don't think I could do it. So I don't even care what the payoff is. I don't think I'd be able to survive. That's, you know, that we can talk about the spreadsheet and what that gets you, but then there's like real life is like, you actually have to, you have to do that every day. So how have you, as somebody, you know, you're, I, I hate the word serial founder, but you've done it a couple of times and you're currently working at a, a, a fairly large company. Twitter is actually pretty small for big company standards, but what's your kind of framework in thinking through, like, how do you survive this? It's funny. The other day I was, I was, we're, we're moving accountants. And so I was going through like seven years of W2s and 1099s and K1s and all this stuff as I was like moving the Dropbox folders over to this new, this new accountant. And I was looking back at 2020 when I left Indeed. I was I was 30 years old and I had been there for a little over three years post acquisition. And I really loved every moment of it, like during the acquisition. I loved the experience of selling a company. The the team was great. My boss was amazing. Got to work directly with the you know CPO and, and CEO. And we built a, a business that ultimately you know it just it just crossed like 1.2 billion users and, and like a ton of revenue. So it was like successful. They made a ton of money on the acquisition. We made money. But the grind of like being there for three years, as indeed grew from you know I think like 4,000 people to like 12,000 people, I hated every moment of it. So it was like the stupidest financial decision I've ever made in my life to go start Lasky, where we paid ourselves nothing for the first year and then you know, sort of like bootstrapped the company to begin with, raised a, a small, you know, seed and kind of expanded. Um, I left so much money on the table, but also so glad that I did it. So I think to your question, it was like, for me, it's, you know, life at a big company is some mix of de-risking things, especially as an entrepreneur. It's actually really nice to have periods in your life, it turns out, where like, I don't need to understand how our PEO works. Like people get health insurance and I don't have to think about it. And if like, somebody in Maryland has an issue with like their dental insurance. They're not like sending me slacks on like Friday night being like, Hey, our like insurance company ruined my life. 
having a team for that, having a team to think about like accounting and bookkeeping, a legal team that's like really amazing. Like all these things that I think when you're starting your own business, whether that's like a VC firm or a fund or you're bootstrapping a business and you're doing, you know, tree trimming or you're going to go like be a venture backed founder. Like we all just are in and out of so many areas of sales and marketing and accounting and legal. And it kind of, it's kind of amazing how like these companies can actually be built and be successful because like I, I said before, I'm bad at context switching, but you think about like the one big thing that actually needs to be done in a company, whether that's like find more customers, make this critical hire, raise these critical funds, like how much of like running the company actually feels like a distraction from doing that thing. So I, I think that the like elimination of distractions and, and sort of de-risking is one big thing. Money is obviously second and opportunity, I think, is is definitely third. I and mean, not necessarily in that particular order, but I think that that's how I think about those things. And so, you know, for me, I think at Indeed, like the decision to leave, it was so nice not having to think about all of those accounting and bookkeeping and legal aspects of the company. I was I was super happy with the money. But for me, it was just like, I felt like there was more opportunity elsewhere. I sort of like been tapped out on what I felt like I could learn. And so a certain amount of that, I, I think you have to make those trade-offs if you care about like achieving something big in the long run, whatever that looks like. And so that was the decision there. And, and I think here at X, it's, it's really tough because I, I enjoy the first two. And I'm also like the opportunity upside of like getting to work with Elon and, and actually, I would say more importantly, like getting to work with a lot of the senior leaders at SpaceX and Tesla and like learn from them and see how they recruit and learn about their hiring practices, like that experience is really hard to replicate. So I think it's it's different for everybody, but those tend to be, I think, the three things that keep me you know, excited and, and locked in longer term at a big co. Yeah, I like it. So you also have a pretty opinionated approach to company building. Uh, I think you, you described it as, do you want to make money or do you want to innovate? So what is what does that mean? Well, it's, I mean, so my my co-founder Daniel and I have have worked at this is our X is our fifth company that we worked at together. So he's he's you know one of my best friends. We worked together basically since the early days of my career, and he and I when 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 it was time to start Lasky, you know, coming out of this like you know selling a company to Indeed and being there for over three years. When we looked at, we we did the thing that I think a lot of founders do or a lot of people do, and we create this big spreadsheet of like, here's all of our life-changing ideas, right? And we had built this spreadsheet over three years where anytime he or I would think of something, we would add it to this like central spreadsheet. And then it comes time to like, cool, we, we've you know left the previous acquirer, we've taken some time off, and it's time to get back into the game and start a new company. When we looked at how we thought about doing that, we basically assigned three criteria to every idea. The first, the first thing was like, is there is there a big opportunity here? Like, and I think that that actually was very interesting. There, there were some things where it was just like, it felt like the thing that we were chasing wasn't big enough. I think, funny enough, like people, you know, it's easy to make fun of recruiting companies because they're so easy to start; they're very hard to scale. But it's like. Recruiting is actually a massive business, right? It's a massive industry. And so we were like, cool, that's exciting to us. Things like, you know, infrastructure and defense and like, you know, mortuaries and stuff were also very interesting to us, even if we knew nothing about them, just because they actually had a ton of spend. The second criteria was sort of like Chris's level of interest and Daniel's level of interest. Like, especially being, you know, second or third time founders, it was like, we're presumably going to do this at a minimum for like a year maximum if things go great and we like IPO and we run the company like for the rest of our lives like we should have some degree of interest so like mortuaries and burial services turns out to be a massive industry and like Daniel and I had zero interest in being like online morticians and so we're like okay cool like our interest on a scale of five is like a zero or one for those things and then the third set of criteria was time to first dollar and this was like this, I, I think, you know, we might have like over indexed on this a bit, but but I do think it's super important where I now like invest and I spend time advising a lot of early stage companies. And, and the sort of joke that you hear about like on X is always oh, that like all these AI companies are just like creating cool technology and then going in, in search of, a, of, of like an actual problem to sort of fit. But that's actually true with a lot of companies like people build really compelling, super awesome technology that they can just never find a use case for. And so for us, it's the opposite. It's like before we write a single line of code, 
we are getting a five thousand dollar commitment from some company in like both of our companies. We we basically did this, and so you know it's easy. There are always trade offs in the way that you think about these things, but in our sort of niche of like HR tech B two B SaaS. It's pretty easy to build like low code or hacky things that like get the job done because again these these companies are very easy to start. It's very easy to be like Turner, you need a investment, you know, analyst. Like let me go post a job on LinkedIn and you know present somebody with some polish, and then you're going to pay me you know fifteen thousand dollars to make that hire. Yeah, it's like a service basically. Yeah, you just like it's like a service recruiting business essentially that, and then eventually you'll add software component to it. Yep, exactly. So we we went heavy on the on the services and we went heavy on like overselling contracts before we had like built any of the platform stuff. And yeah, I mean, it, it meant that we grew revenue very quickly. Like we were not in the staffing business. We were basically like selling access to sort of an online like platform that would allow you to recruit. But we got that to like 3 million of ARR in the first year, I think over 5 million by year two. And so it grew very, very quickly because we were able to add, you know, customers very quickly and, and get, you know, LOIs and contracts signed. Now, I think the, the, the thing that I would probably add as an additional set of criteria that we did not really think critically about was, you know, things like moats and scalability of, of some of these businesses and especially like interest in actually running them long term. I think it's easy to say, oh yeah, I can run that business forever, but I don't know, you get into some of these like service heavy businesses and it's just a grind for at least my personality and, and Daniel's personality. So Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I think about that a lot too. Like I like we talked about earlier, I, I probably did not make the most rational career decision, but I think it's the most fun, the most interesting personally, just this intersection of all the stuff that I do, where I really hope I do it for forever, for a really long time. And it's like at that point, it's like you can you can out compete anyone. You just keep doing it. You know, maybe, you know, you'd be the best in the world at something, you'll be successful, you'll make money, you'll hopefully, hopefully, if you enjoy it, you know, you'll have a good life. So the time in market is so underrated. It is so underrated. Like, I see this over and over again, like in our first company, which was in the assessment space, you look at there, there's all these companies that make like three, five, 10, some of the top ones make like $50 million a year. And a lot of them are basically like one to three people consulting businesses where Target or Nike is like, hey, you know, we need to hire 115,000 new retail associates in the next year. Like, how do we do this? And somebody with like a PhD in industrial organizational psychology will come to them and present this master plan. Like there's no technology. It's like they will sit at a computer and they will research like all of the attributes that make like Nike footwear salespeople super successful. And they'll sell this like million and a half dollar project that like basically can be created by two people in a room. And so that industry was fascinating to us because it's like, they don't have websites. They, there, there are no like Yelp reviews or Google reviews for these businesses. They've never, they don't know what G2 reviews are. Like they, they've never created an app. They don't want to use apps. They hate technology. They don't like technology. And, and yet like, there's just like, there are dozens of those businesses that do, you know, three to 10, again, the top ones doing like 25 to $50 million per year with a very small team. And those businesses are like amazing. But it's like you look at when they started and it's like this guy has been doing this since 1972. Like he's retired and then his son got a PhD in industrial organizational psychology and is now like carrying on the family business. And it's like a, it's like a terrible product. It's like the end product everybody hates. But it's like they've just built 30, 50 years of relationships in these businesses. And I think like those of us who are, are like founders and like jump around between a bunch of different things it's amazing how much just like you can dig your heels in. And if you're IBM or Oracle, like you can ship terrible products, but like people will just buy them forever because you've like, you've spent decades establishing your name. So it's, it, yeah, that, that piece is underrated for sure. So I want to hit one more, one more question related to co-founder stuff. Daniel said, I had to ask you to talk about the sandwich incident. What is the sandwich incident? We went through YC in summer of 2015, where, and there was a lot of stuff changing in YC. One of the big changes that you saw was that YC was going from being like a very internet focused to now kind of under like Sam Altman's influence to a lot more like hard tech, deep tech stuff. So we had like a couple nuclear companies in our batch, Eight Sleep was in our batch. And th those were like some of the earlier hardware focused companies. There was a company 
who I don't remember their name, but they were building like robotics to essentially help like subway sandwich shops, like make sandwiches without people. And it was demo day and it was in, I guess, like computer science museum or whatever in, in Mountain View, where they, they used to do all the demo days. And so there's like six or 700 investors. And I, I don't actually remember, I should have synced with, with Daniel, but my recollection is that Gary Tan, who's now, you know, the head of Y Combinator was standing at the end of this operation and in front of like a large group of people this sandwich robot machine basically like launched a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at Gary Tan's face in front of like 150 other <laughs> investors. <laughs> and it was like hilarious, like opener for this company to go like fundraise on. <laughs> but it was like, it was a complete record scratch moment. Like I, 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 I remember like condiments like spraying through the air and like Gary kind of like catching this like wheat bread, like peanut butter jelly thing that either hit like his face or his shirt or something like that. So this, this sandwich thing kind of like blew up in our batch and uh, it was, it was very amazing. So that was the sandwich story. Amazing. I'm glad. I'm glad he suggested that. So I want to make sure we hit all the topics you want to hit on. You are known on Twitter for being prolific, making memes. How do you use memes for marketing? Like what are things to think about if I want to try it myself? I I think I started by, you know, there's it's it's actually changed a lot, but I got really into Twitter in the summer of 2020. That's when I it was like COVID times. I was still at big company, like and so I got into it then and it felt like summer of 2020, for those of us who have been on Twitter for a while, was what I call thread boy summer. It was like peak taking Wikipedia articles, turning them into threads, getting lots of attention, going viral. And so I kind of came on Twitter fascinated by this. I actually did it myself. Like I was like, I'm going to go research this oil tycoon and write a thread. And like, I'm going to get 700 likes and it totally worked. Over time, I kind of, I didn't really know what else to expect. And I think a lot of it was just because I was following a lot of tech founders and VCs. They were all just sort of following this format. And so I think the meme stuff started because I was just like, somebody needs to make fun of this. Like, I think that the tides were just turning a little bit where I think like you and like Logan Bartlett and some other people were like starting to do a lot of like, you know, comedy stuff, like in the direction of of some of those like threads. And like you were, I think by that time, like doing some of like the, the TikTok and like short video stuff about like all of the SPACs that were coming out. Right. And so I was like, all right, I need to like jump onto this train. There's like a couple guys who are starting to like do funny ish content and like trying to like make fun and like remix those, those types of like just boring ass threads that everybody's doing. And so it's like now from being on, on, on Twitter for a while, it's like the content certainly ebbs and flows. Like there's like this like vibe shift every six to 12 months that happens on the platform. And I think like, it felt like, you know, those of us who like rode that wave, we went from this like very serious, like COVID area era to like, all of the like bullshit SPACs to like Nikola stock, like shooting up and, and not being a real company. And, you know, then like Trevor Milton getting arrested. And it was just like, it was kind of like, everything's really serious and intense and the world's serious and intense that everything's very funny. And so I just thought it was like a very kind of interesting novel way to break through and get attention. And I noticed like I would post a meme, I would get a lot of engagement and that like engagement was, was pretty addictive, but I, I think right now, I mean, there's, it's so easy to look at like people just go on Reddit or Instagram and stuff and like look at memes and they bring that content over to, to Twitter and it still does really well. Like that, that has sort of worked forever for, for as long as I've been on the platform. But I think, yeah, for me, it was just like the voice of being in the room of people that were sort of like poking fun at some of these people that took themselves too seriously. It was a lot more fun than like trying to be somebody who took themselves super seriously. So how do you make memes? Like, how do you come up with ideas? I have my own process. I'm assuming yours is probably better than mine because I feel like you're, I mean, I started before you, but I feel like you've surpassed me at this point. Like you're more prolific than me. I, I don't know. It's, I mean, the, the actual process is, I mean, I, I've never used drafts. I don't use like Hype Fury or Tweet Hunter or Buffer or any of the scheduling tools. So I post everything in real time. I have a, I have a, like a, an actual like Google Slides uh, actually I actually have two, but they each have hundreds of images. So I, I don't use Photoshop. I mean, I use Photoshop and Figma, but I never use it for memes. All of my memes are created in Google Slides. Google Slides? What? I did not expect you to say that. Wow. Okay. So you just have like hundreds of slides or just have like a template? 
And I kind of, yeah, there's no, there's like, sometimes there's templates and I'll like put a template in there and I don't know what to do with it. And so if I'm in like, if I'm in, like, I have my like succession section because I'm like notorious for like succession memes. And so I'll have like kind of a loose section of like all of the like funny, like, Kendall Roy, like Logan Roy, like good like screenshots or like I don't really do video stuff, but it's it's pretty much all like image plus caption. And so I'll, I'll like try to like bundle those in a section. And I'm like a like a really shitty librarian where like I kind of know like depending on what content I want, I kind of know like how far to like scroll down at my like mad map of like content. Yeah, it's it's pretty sad. My my people you know, on my team were like, I don't believe that you don't use drafts. And like, I, I pulled out my like phone and my drafts folders, you know, empty. And it was like, this is so. It's like anytime I just see something, I try to react to it with a with a meme. And sometimes it's like you have those like shower thoughts where you just like think of something great. But I mean, it's like you only need to put if you put out like six months of really good content, you can forever remix that content. That's the thing nobody talks about. It's like if you look at the people who were like really killing it what like Sahil Bloom and what like Nick Tuber and, and those types of guys are doing it's like they just say the same things over and over every three to six months and then they sort of just take anything that outperforms that sort of like meets the certain threshold of quality and they like add it in and they take the low performing stuff out and you end up with these accounts that basically just like say the same things over and over I, I find myself like doing that with memes you, you like rely on the same memes as crutches to a certain extent but I also try to be like a little bit more thoughtful and like weave some some like newer fresher content in but yeah there's a lot of inspiration out there on on you know instagram and and reddit and stuff like that yeah i think my my best performing i mean i've never done anything better than this is just the caption vcs adding value to portfolio companies i've gotten i've gotten a million view over a million views with that caption on insert whatever viral video or image literally like 10 times probably maybe 20 times over the last couple of years it's like it's literally the first one i go to whenever there's like a funny video trying to like all right well this one work yes all right this is what i'm going with yep don't 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 fix it if it's not broken yeah if, if it and then if it works just do it again in a month then people will forget and it's fine yeah so then this is actually a question from our friend Trunk Fan. He said, what are your top three meme templates? You kind of already hit on that, but. Yeah, I think I've got some like Kendall, Kendall Roy, Logan Roy succession ones, some like Kieran Culkin succession ones that I, I feel like I use a lot. I I really like the, I had these like series of masterclass memes. I don't know if I, if I've done them in a while, but anytime somebody would take a big L like in the in the sort of you know like late 2020 early 2021 period this started because Dave Portnoy founder of Barstool was like doing a lot of like online gambling in the stock market basically and there was he, one day yeah, in particular yeah and he would he lost like 2.2 million in one one afternoon and so i just took i took like the masterclass idea and i took like a professional photo of Dave Portnoy and I said, Dave Portnoy teaches losing shitloads of money. And I put the masterclass logo and I screenshotted it and I like replied. And then he replied to it. And and then it kind of went viral from there. And then anytime there would be like a big L from a large public figure, Keith Raboy got into like a big fight over residential real estate. And so I made one that said like Keith Raboy teaches online real estate. And I replied to him with that. Chamath, when he posted his like famous gym pic of like him with his his little calves, I, I did something like Chamath Paul Habatia teaches leg day. And so I, I like reuse those over and over. So that's probably like the, the second most used. Third, man, that's a good question. I feel like I used to post like a lot of Elon content before I worked for Elon. <laughs> Just like screen grabs and like funny faces and like funny photos of him. That was probably like some of my peak like 2022 content. And then like anything like during like the open AI crisis uh, did did really well too. Yeah, I think I, I remember we were joking about this in the group chat. I mean, I think you had like 100 million views or something during the open AI weekend when that whole turmoil. It was like your Super Bowl, basically. It was the Super Bowl. Yeah, exactly. One other question from Twitter we had to hit on. It was from uh, Nikita Beer. <laughs> he said, what's your favorite proprietary trade secret at X? Yeah, so so I, I answered him in 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 the thread where I told him that we do these creator payouts and we we pay out a lot of money, you know, now tens of thousands of creators. And I told him on on Twitter that you know we we were taking that out of Elon's personal checking account and we we didn't tell him. So that was my 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 reply there. I think the the proprietary trade secret 
would would be around our our hotel business at, at X is is booming. You know, we turned the eighth floor into hotel rooms, and I'd say we're probably outselling any hotel in the city. So, in terms of like new revenue streams for us, we're looking at getting into the uh, hospitality and hotel space. You go down there, there's some really nice bathrobes, and uh, there's like showers available, and you get key cards to the rooms. It's it's a pretty nice facility down there at Tenth uh, Market. And that's even more amazing considering, like, I don't think Elon pays rent, right? According to the headlines, I don't think he's paid rent since he bought the company. So that's, that's impressive. Who's to say who's owed rent, really? That's fair. Okay, so I have one last question. This is from a question from the traded VC community on Instagram. They want to know, what is your favorite startup or VC story? I mean, I think we all, like if you've been in tech long enough, you have the, the the whoopsie of like the company that goes crazy that you didn't take seriously. I have two and then I'll let them pick which one's better. I went to a uh, like an office warming party, I think in like early 2013 at GitHub's new headquarters in, in San Francisco. Um, and there was this guy, like everybody was wearing their like t-shirt and jeans. And there was this guy who's like going around the party and he's like, hey, like I'm in YC and we're going to like corner the financial market, blah, blah, blah. And he like hands me this card and you, it's a QR code and you scan the back and you get one Bitcoin. He basically showed up to GitHub's office and was like aggressively trying to recruit everybody that was at this like GitHub party to come and work for him. And it was Brian Armstrong at Coinbase. He, he had, I think like it was him and his co-founder and like two engineers at that time. I think they were like actively in YC. And I, I not only didn't take him seriously, I never scanned the QR code to claim my free Bitcoin. So big $50,000 L on that one. Probably, you know, not to say that I could have gotten hired there, but like, you know, probably lost a couple hundred million not trying to, to get hired at Coinbase. And then there was a similar one. It actually happened like a year before. So 2012, 2013 was a dark time time for me in, in my hiring days. I had this I had this guy reach out to me. So I worked at a startup that had been bought by Zillow. And one of our VCs, he was like, hey, I know that you're sort of doing like all things business development, biz ops stuff at Zillow. I just wrote a check into this company that is, I think it was 21 or 22 people. And they really want you to interview with them. And so if you could, you know, consider it, you'd have to, I think I'd have to go to like Mountain View or something. And I had just moved to San Francisco at that point. So it was quite a bit of a commute. And so I turned them down for that. And I said, no, the company was WhatsApp. And there was like a very famous story. And again, not that I like could have gotten hired, but the fact that I didn't take that interview plagues me to this day, because there was a famous story about like the, the WhatsApp team, I think was like 60 people when they sold for like $40 billion. And their business guy, who was a pretty young guy who like ended up taking over business operations and biz dev for them. There were like stories coming out like two years after I declined even taking or accepting this interview of, of this guy personally making like $800 million. So, you know, we all, we all have our missteps, but those were two things of like, you, if you're just in and around tech, you like miss out on those opportunities. And I, I don't, I don't think about them weekly. I think about them nightly and I cry myself to sleep every night because of those. Yeah. I'm assuming they probably inspire some of the content, some of the memes, at least hopefully. Yes. You know, you, you, you can't, you can't win them all very, very happy and, and fortunate from where I ended up. But I definitely, those two, there's like other ones, but those two are, are particularly painful for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry for your giant L's. <laughs> very, very, very unfortunate. People, people are always like, where, where, where should I work? And I'm like, let me tell you the list of places that I wouldn't apply to in 2024. And if you go apply to all of those places, like guaranteed, you know, sent to millionaire status. You'll be able to buy an island in the Pacific somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, this is super fun. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for listening. If you don't want to miss a future episode, subscribe to my newsletter in the show notes and you'll get new episodes plus of transcripts in your inbox every week. If you want to support the show, share this episode with a friend. Hope you enjoyed. See you next episode.